要。We're here with Jason Kluper in NC Fit in uh, in California. Before we throw in and welcome Jace, which we've already been talking for about half an hour, but before we uh, <laughs> before we get him in and let him introduce himself, we're going to throw to as usual Tommy's tribute. Okay. Well, welcome welcome aboard, my friend. I've done um I've done uh no one knows what it's like so behind blue eyes, but I've done the limp biscuit version. So and I'm going I'm going full ham on this one. So it's going to be interesting. All right. Be flat minor, be flat minor. All right, here we go. Ready, Cam? <laughs> no one knows what it's like to be this strong. For this long Bill, can you get rid of that thing We're <laughs> second right now We're gonna keep going Like our friend Jace <laughs> And I don't know what it's like To be this fit Because I'm this shit At CrossFit <laughs> <laughs> Here we go, now it's full ham But my dream Cause my ability is spastic <laughs> Kaliper, I've watched you for so many years So can you help me to be a man? Welcome aboard, mate. <laughs> We're on. Uh, very good, very thanks, good. Brother. <laughs> you know, it's so funny, man. I've, I've done a lot of podcasts and a lot of different things. You're the first man yeah. who's, ever, who's ever serenaded me with a guitar. <laughs> well, uh, it's good. Oh, that was great. Uh, and really you're, actually, you're actually really good. Oh, thanks, mate. I feel, yeah, I mean, the keto definitely helped me a little bit. I was slightly <laughs> flat than I thought I would be. But. The keto's putting you on that level. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Jace, uh, Thanks for allowing us into your offices today. My friend, why don't you, um, not everyone's going to know who you are from our listeners, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, and uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so welcome to our office. Here we are at NC Fit. This is our headquarters. <coughs> We're in Campbell, California. Um, we have, uh, basically, I started the company in 2008, and I won the CrossFit Games, started the company, and uh, graduated from college all at the same time. Yeah. Proposed to my now wife, like, a couple <laughs> months before that. So it was a crazy little bit. Um, but since then, you know, we've outgrown our space. We've opened, opened, opened. Now, basically, our business is split into two verticals. We have our corporate wellness, and we have our regular open to the gym uh, or open to the public gyms. Mm-hmm. So we have about 20 locations globally, uh, about 150 employees that, that work in the organization. Sure, and um, this is where our kind of back end takes place, mm-hmm. right? The the social media stuff, the you know podcast, you know, YouTube, all mm-hmm. that stuff kind of occurs back here, mm-hmm. plus all of our strategy for our corporate wellness and things of that nature. So mm-hmm. you're kind of where it all kind of is at. And then that's what we do. I mean, and then aside from that, obviously from a business perspective, that's, that's that side mm-hmm. from a, a fitness perspective, you know, I've competed at the CrossFit games eight times, mm-hmm. uh, been on the podium three times, Team USA three times, had a lot of great, great experiences with CrossFit and competing in it professionally. Um, but, you know, obviously shifted gears when my daughter got sick uh, two years ago and with leukemia. And since then, a lot's changed and, um, you know, it's kind of shifted a lot of my focus, shifted mm. a lot of my perspective. So here we are today. Mm. Oh, Beautiful, man. man. Awesome. Um, let me ask you because it's obviously uh, probably the most important question above all business and, you know, personal, you know, CrossFit Games kind of stuff. Like you, you mentioned before the show that your daughter's in a good position now and, and, and stuff. Like what – that must have been extremely scary when you say, you know, it changed your, changed your mindset on uh, where you were going with everything. Like talk us a little bit through that if you if – you, if you Yeah, I mean, right, right now is a really great time. I mean, the month of March – 
is a big month for us. So March uh, 5th, which is coming up soon, is her last IV chemo, yep. which mm-hmm. is like a major deal. Yeah, for sure. And she's already gotten her port taken out, which is a major deal. Mm-hmm. And then her last actual chemo treatment by pill at home is on March 29th. And mm-hmm. then we're gone for a week in Cabo. You March know? Madness. So yeah, March Madness. It's... it's <laughs> It's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's been, t- uh, two years and like three months. So it's been a long time coming. And, um, I, I, we didn't think when we first, when she first got diagnosed, I never thought I'd see this day. Yeah. Uh, it, it just seems so far away. Yeah. Cause at the time she was four years old. Fuck man. So now I'm like, when they tell you, Oh, it's going to be two and a half years. You're like, dude, she's only four years <clears throat> old. Like yeah. you're telling me it's going to be, you know, it's insane. And, and, and so now here we are, it's kind of, I'd like to say it's, it's actually, you know, uh, anybody who has children kind of knows what I'm saying when I say like the days are long, but the years are short. Yeah. That's kind of the way it has been. Mm-hmm. Like looking back on it, it's gone by quicker than I thought. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you look at it in the macro scale kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, we've had a couple big scares, but for the most part, we've been super, super blessed. And I feel like in a unique way, you know, we've been kind of granted this, this, we've been granted this perspective. We've been granted this, this blessing of her being okay mm. to go out and share the message, share positivity and, and do a lot of good for a lot of families. So That's my wife awesome, and I are man. highly philanthropic in that sense, because mm-hmm. we, we really feel like someone's been looking out for us for sure. Um, we've had our back up against the wall a number of times and we always feel like we've kind of gone out the other side and there's some families that aren't as fortunate. So for Absolutely. us, it's a huge focus. Absolutely. Can I ask, um, can I ask a relatively <laughs> difficult question but like with your daughter being four years old and with everything that she was going through when it all came about like how do you actually how do you communicate what's going on to a four-year-old in this scenario like how hard is that yeah i mean so she's she was she's four going you know she she was like four and a half and you just the thing about it is is as a parent you have the responsibility and the ability to explain things however you want. Yeah. So like, imagine if I was like, Hey, this, you know, instead of this being green, it's, this is, this is a uh, purple mm-hmm. and, but you wouldn't know any different cause I'm sharing that with you. Right. Yeah. And you didn't know any different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when we first told her about what leukemia was, we had the opportunity to explain what it was. Yeah. She didn't have any of that background like you do of people yeah. passing scary. away. Scary. Exactly. Yeah. Scary. Scary. So when we explained it, you know, we kind of, we, you know, the night that she was diagnosed, basically I read a lot of books. Um, basically I stayed up all night just reading. Right. Mm-hmm. And there was one book in particular. It was like, uh, it basically talked about, um, basically your white and your red, uh, blood cells and how they're ninjas. So we kind of use this book as a way to kind of read it to her. And mm-hmm. we use that same thing for the way that she lost her hair and stuff. We mm-hmm. kind of utilize books because we're not experts. So we utilize these books as a way to kind of, uh, you know, ease it. Yeah. But for the mm. most part, what it was, was a, a big takeaway my wife gave me was like the night that she was diagnosed the next day, you know, we're all kind of like figured it out. And so family would come by and like Ashley's rule was, you know, look, if they want to cry, they could cry as much as they want. Just don't cry in front of Ava. Yeah. And so at this way, Ava never really understood the gravity, at least in the beginning, mm-hmm. because everybody was, I don't want to use the term positive, but yeah. they were, they were walking in knowing what they're getting into. Yeah, mm-hmm. for there's, sure. There's very clear rules. Yeah. When you walk past this door, there's no tears. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you're going to cry, do it outside. Mm-hmm. So that was, I think something good that we did. Yeah, yeah that's sure. great. And like children are such information sponges at, at, at that age, you know? So I was actually just having a thought when you were saying that of like how that's going to influence her as a kid when she grows older, you know, the way she'll see sort of adversity in her life, you know? Yeah, mm. for sure. I mean, when you go through something like that at such a young age, it's, um, I, 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 whether we realize it today or not, I think long-term it will pay a lot of, we're going to have a lot of challenges from different <coughs> medicines that she's taken mm. because I think there might be some concerns in the future, but hey, when, when they come, we will, we will attack them the same way we did today. Mm. But I think, you know, she'll be a lot stronger for it. And mm. I think that uh, it'll make a great college essay. Mm. Yeah, yeah that's be, if, if nothing else, if, if nothing else, you get a good essay out of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how does that change your perception? Because you said before, um, it's kind of changed the way you sort of shaped the business side of things as well. Like, is that more influential to the wellness side or what does that sort of do? Um, I think, you know, when it comes to, I mean, it's mainly the philanthropic side, right? Is that before she got sick, you know, we would donate to the Navy SEAL Foundation. We would donate to this, to that. Mm. And everything's great. But when you're really hit with something and we actually see it firsthand, um, I, I think it just changes what we want to get behind. So as a company, mm. we know we want to get behind, right? We want to get behind this pediatric cancer, supporting families. And, um, 
And then just as a human being, obviously it's changed my perspective, right? Because, um, it, it, again, if nothing else, every time I go to the hospital, I'm just humbled. You know, you have people complaining about, you know, not getting the right type of ketchup on their hamburger, mm. yeah. but there's much bigger problems in this world. Mm. And I think that, um, it, it took this experience for me to kind of realize that, you know, it's not that big of a deal what you're probably going through today. Mm. Yeah. Right. Mm. Like mm. in the grand scheme of things, you're okay. Yeah. For sure. sure. Yeah. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. So I wonder, um, with, uh, with everything that Ava went through, I've just lost my train of thought. Have you? Yeah, Completely I lost gone. my train of thought. Yeah. You put me under the pump here. Well, well, but, um, she, she, she's in remission now, though, hey? She's yeah, so she actually, so, so a lot of people don't, you know, I didn't know what remission was. I, I didn't know anything about this until yeah. she got it. But basically what happens is you get these day 29 results. So 29 days after she got diagnosed, they go in and they take a sample out of her uh, hip. And then based on that sample, it, it's either as good as it gets or it could be as bad as it gets, mm, right? Yeah. So that's a big day. There's certain days that are big days. That was one of them, right? Yeah. And we were fortunate that at that moment, technically, given the test, X amount of one in a million, you couldn't see the strand. Mm -hmm. So she went into remission on day 29. Thing is, they still need a treat for over two years because mm, right. they know that if they don't, it will it will more than likely come back. Yep. And in right. boys, yep. it's three and a half years because mm. it actually comes back in their testicle. Oh, right. yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. So, so what I was uh, what I was meaning to ask before I lost what I was um, talking about. <laughs> I just gave him a brief <laughs> second. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll um, feel this one. <laughs> no, so so my question to you though, Jace, is like with you and your wife, like how did you actually go about getting through it? Because it's obviously such an emotional thing. Like, did you put specific things into place to keep your mindset where it needs to be, or like you did you start meditating? Did you like did you journal things? Like, how did you? As a, as a person, as a father, you know, how did you get through it? Yeah, I mean, I think understanding what was in our control was at our, <clears throat> our control, you know, educating ourselves, but making sure we were finding the right information. Mm -hmm. I think trying to be supportive and, and knowing like I'm not a doctor and I'm not going to administer a chemotherapy, but I can mm -hmm. be supportive. I could be loving and I could, I could do everything I can. So, you know, we stayed in the hospital for probably a total of like maybe three months over the last two years. Mm -hmm. And when we're in the hospital, we just try and stay recharged, refresh. I try and take, you know, active workout breaks in the, in the hospital parking lot come back so I, I could bring some positive energy mm -hmm. but for the most part you know it's it was, it's been a family affair like it's been a family event like my mother-in-law was over every day my father was there every day my parents took care of my son like i mean it's just been a whole family dynamic yeah that, for sure you know especially like we had one long stint in the hospital that was a, a little over a month right that's a long time to be in the hospital 100 percent. so man. you know i didn't leave for a month because my whole rule was you never know when the doctors are going to come in. And those guys at the time were kind of like gods to me. I mean, they still are. Mm -hmm. They're like this this godly figure to me, right? Because they've saved my daughter's yeah. life. Mm -hmm. So when they come in for rounds, I want to be there because I don't ever want to be, I don't ever want to be behind a decision that I wasn't there to like, I don't want to know they were making a decision. And I couldn't at least know why you they were making You got to be fully informed of everything that is, sure. is to be informed. Every single yeah, thing. Right? Absolutely. Nothing's more important. Yeah. So my whole policy was I had to be within five minutes of the room, right? Mm -hmm. So if I went for a run, you know, I better run a fast mile yeah, back. Yeah, you're running, you're running 100 meter, 100 meter sprints back and forth. Yeah, yeah. You know I mean? <laughs> Call you sign. Yeah, I mean, and, and so the, I guess the thing is, is that, you know, uh, just trying to educate ourselves and try and have like date nights, right? So like my wife and I, mm. especially when we were in there for a month, my mother-in-law would come over, she'd watch Ava, and then we can go out across the street. They got to know us at this place called Fleming's, which is right across the street from Stanford University mm -hmm. or Hospital. Mm -hmm. And we'd just go there. And some nights, we'd just get some appetizers. Some nights, we'd have four, five, six margaritas. You know, just, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Whatever you <laughs> needed at the time. Yeah. As, as Sometimes we'd have 10 appetizers and 12 margaritas. Yeah. As you said, you're trying and to bring positive energy. <laughs> yeah, it, just, yeah. it just depended on what we needed that night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shit, man. So um, what we do, we just bring in like equipment to the gym or something or just doing little yeah, so, burpee wads. <laughs> so I would do a lot of like, so um, they had an auditorium where they held like um, a, a events mm -hmm. and like I got to know the guys. So like him and I would just be like kind of bros. I'd go in there whenever I wanted when there wasn't people using it and just do body weight style workouts, mm -hmm. right? And then... Um, and then I brought our company truck with barbells and weights. If I wanted to get something more, I just parked it in the garage. Yeah, classic. So I think that's a really true like, crossfit style. But it's like <laughs> not even. I was just going to say it's actually a really good takeaway for something so big to impact your life like that. There is still like an element of not like not um, self centered or anything, but to keep yourself balanced as well at the same yeah, yeah. time. You know, so. Yeah, I think and that's really great. Positive, yeah. positive, like you said. You know, you need yeah. those endorphins when you're going through. That's right, and and it's strongly encouraged by the doctors. They just need to find a better way of administering it. You know, yeah, we started yeah. offering yoga there, 
it didn't pick up the same type of traction I'm looking for. We're going to bring it back. But we started offering yoga at, for a free service to all the inpatient people mm. because fitness is a little bit tough. Um, yeah. but, but yoga just is a way for to get people out of their room. And get them moving. The people utilized it. They loved it. Mm. But for me, it's like I left. You know, you're in this hospital room. Obviously, stress is high. Mm. You're in this small room with me and my wife and my daughter for a month. Mm. Leaving for five, ten minutes or leaving, you know, five minutes away for 45 minutes to get into workout and come back is a healthy thing to do. Yeah. And you need to do it because, yeah. it, you know, my wife needs to do it too. Mm. Uh, mm. Jay, so I've got a um, question for you. So... Uh, there's a book called Try by Sebastian Junga. Have you heard of it or read it? I have not. Talks about um, talks about when the chips are down. It uses um, one of the uh, chapters or maybe a, a big section of the book talks about as humans, when the chips are down is when people bond together the most. Yeah. The perfect example in most recent history is 9-11. So people talk about 9-11 yeah. was obviously horrible, but New York City was a buzz for two or three years afterwards. Everyone felt like they were back in a community. Everyone was uh, reached out, helped mm. each other, and they right. felt really, really tight and really happy because that's what happiness is you know you want to have community strong bonds around oh, you yeah. do you feel like and this is like obviously the worst thing that you can go through as a family do you feel like it made you closer as a family yeah, yeah for sure I mean back to that note about New York you know I just got back from New York uh, yesterday and I was I was looking at you know uh you know, where the, the new monuments are being set up, right? Mm -hmm. And how after the towers went down, how they raised, I mean, millions and millions, like mm. overnight, right? Yeah. It's because people, they wanted to be about, they wanted to be about that community. They wanted to be about something bigger than themselves. Yep. And they want, at the end of the day, we're all Americans, right? Or, mm -hmm. in, you know, in the United States. You got yeah. Right. <laughs> hey, I'm an American. Yeah. And, we and, got an uh, Esther. Come yeah. on, bro. <laughs> yeah, we're Americans for two weeks. <laughs> True. <laughs> we nearly and, didn't get an Esther, actually. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, like, with, with the family, you know, it's the same idea. It's like, they felt like they got hit. It wasn't just me. And, and you know, I, I don't think it's fair. Like, yeah, my wife and I have seen some stuff that the rest of the family haven't because we've kind of sheltered them from some of these experiences because, yeah. frankly, no one needs to see it. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I mean, having them around is so important. I think, you know, as a society, we've gotten a little bit less, you know, tribe-like. Yeah. And I think uh, when something like this happens, you just realize that I don't know how you do it without the community. Mm, right? And that's yeah. why, especially in the Bay Area, people are having less children. Because it's challenging to support a family when both parents are working, this and that. But when you have the grandparents around and this and around, it's like a it, you can yeah. have more children. You know, it's mm, yeah. more support. Hundred percent. And that this leads into kind of like what we'll probably talk about in a second. Like obviously the business side of NC Fit, because you guys create that community and that tribe for mm. people. You know, you you take people back to because like you say, people consider a desk you know 60 hours a week come home spend very very minimal time with their loved ones and, and their friends and family whereas and then gyms are like I always talk about the third place you know you're happy, yep, you're happy place um, and that look I, I would love to talk to you about that like that side of your life the business side because you have a like an incredible drive I, I assume like you have how many how many uh, locations do you have now you said you have 15 locations yeah 20 tw 20 locations worldwide yeah, yeah. so where did that come from obviously not everybody wants to become a, a, a major force in fitness and spread it here, there, and everywhere. Like, yeah. where does your drive to do that come from? I, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, it's just kind of built in. I mean, I, I just think that as a business, we need to constantly be evolving and adapting. Mm. And to create trajectory for our staff is so important, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to continue to grow and develop. And we want to help more people. Like, at the end of the day, we could do a lot more good the bigger we get, Yeah. right? The, the more money we generate, the more revenue we can, the more good we could do for our staff, mm -hmm. the more we can give back to our members, the more members we could support with more fitness. We're in a business of fitness. I mean, it's a good thing to help people yeah, with, that's right? right. Mm. And, and, and so for me, I just look at it like, okay, create opportunities for our staff. If the more staff we could create opportunities for, the more people they could impact. Mm. The more people they can impact, the more outside influence we could have. So for mm -hmm. example, we host an annual blood drive. <clears throat> It's the largest in Northern California, right? Because we have so many members here. They want to be a, something bigger than themselves. And so we encourage them to donate blood because I've seen it save people's lives. Yeah. But that's an example of how a business can do good, but still be profitable. Yeah, right? that's right. That's right. It's like um, there was a fantastic um, conversation Sam Harris had on his podcast with this guy, William McCaskill, and he was talking about effective altruism. So giving without getting anything from yourself uh, back to yourself. But there's a point there where you have to like, do you yeah. actually take more money for yourself, grow your business, be more entrepreneurial, drive yourself harder and so on and so forth, not give as much back because you can affect more people. You know what I mean? There's well, I that fine line. I agree with that altruism thing because it's like if you believe in the product and you believe in the value you can give, you're getting something back anyway by giving to those people. 
You know, like you just said, you were speaking right. to Gary Vee about two, two days ago or so. Yeah. And one of the biggest things he always says that I love is the best way to be um, selfless is to be selfish. So you get yourself right first and then you go, hey, well, these things that have worked with me or whatever it is, yeah. you know, this actually really, really helps. And I believe in that. So I can give that away to the people that I'm trying to help. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think for us, you know, from a business perspective, I look at it like a sport, right? I mean, I've competed professionally in sport across it for a long time and I want to win. Yeah. Right? I'm very mm. competitive. Yeah. In business, I want to win. And, and what is winning for us? It's continuously growing, creating more opportunity, helping more people become more fit. And then with that huge network, now what can we do with it, mm. right? We can do all kinds of good stuff from mm-hmm. blood drives to philanthropic work. Mm-hmm. But you got to have the network. You got to have the reach to do really good stuff. Yeah, and once right. you get that reach, you have a responsibility to do good with it. Yeah, yeah. Mm, I mean, sure. at least that's, that's my perspective. For on sure, it. for mm, sure. That's great. So what hey, about, um, oh, you got, yeah. no, oh, well, I just wanted to, I wanted to bring it back to its roots a bit. How did you get the nickname Bear? The big oh. bear. <laughs> I don't, honestly, How do you think, man? Yeah, think, yeah, that's right. I think it's because <laughs> you you know, bear? <laughs> the California bear is like, a, you know, it's on our flag, right? Yeah. And it's a very symbolic of, of California. And so, you know, early on, it was like the California Bear Rogue Fitness put out a shirt. And I think it's just been that way ever since. Oh, really? <laughs> Fuck, yeah. man. I thought it was something. I thought it was just like the way you kind of muscled around. It's like, no, all right, I, the big bear's ready to I pick mean, up I a mean, bar. You got a hairy chest? Maybe, maybe yeah. You got a hairy chest, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Hairy crack. <laughs> no, no, I, I can't clean. Call me the hairy crack bear. <laughs> um, yeah, so when you're going through this whole growth period, uh, growth period with um, NC Fit and so forth, like, what were the hurdles you kind of cross because there's obviously levels to business you know there's yeah. like you know the way that I look at it is like peaks and troughs like you get to a certain point you're like oh fuck I've got to put on a bunch of staff here and then all your systems change and you have to kind of get the hang of that and then you know grow again get to a point where you're like okay now we have to put on a second you know a second establishment that I'm not going to be there I'm not going to be able to oversee mm, right. like what were the, some of the biggest hurdles because like you said you've got a, quite a large team yeah what were the things that you um Picked up along the way, kind of thing as an entrepreneur. Uh, I mean, the thing is, is like I'm a I'm a gym rat at, at its at its initial thing, right? Mm-hmm. So I think it's over the years, just you know, I work. I used to work the front desk at a at a conventional gym for years, mm-hmm. and at night I would go with the owner and ride the elliptical and pick his brain about business. And so I learned a lot about the business of fitness from him, and I learned a lot about practical coaching, uh, et cetera, from CrossFit space. So putting those together was organic for me because I already had this background in the conventional gym Mm -hmm. where it was about being business, right? Mm, Not just opening as a hobby, but actually thinking about it as a business. So as I grew, I thought about it more as a business. Okay, I have one location. Let's make it profitable. Now all of a sudden we have a coach that needs an opportunity. How do we create an opportunity for him? Well, I don't want him to go do something on his own. Let's do it with him. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of organically happened that way. Now, obviously hurdles is as you professionalize, as you grow, it's maintaining quality, right? And it's creating trajectory for your people. And I think over the years, you know, I think, I think we've done okay, but I think we could have done better with, um, laying out the expectation early and often. I think sometimes I just assume people knew what we wanted, but yeah. didn't really explain what it was. Mm-hmm. And that's something we could have done a lot better earlier on. It could have solved a lot of problems for us. Mm-hmm. So you mean in terms of like the vision of the company or you mean the, the what your, your expectation is for each individual employee? That's right. Yeah. yeah, it's like with, with each individual, like I would think like for me, it's like work hard, get, you just boom, mm. boom, boom. Like when you hire someone, it's like just... For me, it's like, I don't need someone to tell me what to do. I just want to go out there and just make it happen. I yeah. want to go grow the business. I want to coach class. I want to offer the best product because I'm inspired. I'm driven. But not everybody's built that way. And mm, I think nah. if I had just clarified that earlier on, like, mm. hey, listen, your roles and responsibilities are these. And this is where you'll go if you do X. Mm-hmm. If I had done that earlier, I think it would have helped out a lot. Mm. Because you know, I use the example, like, if you're at Starbucks and you call your wife, you're like, hey, you want me to drink? And, and she's like, sure. But you don't ask what. Then you bring her home a drink and she's unsatisfied because maybe you got her the wrong drink. Yeah, yeah. But you, got me a, you got me a soft drink. I asked for right. a fucking bagel. <laughs> right, yeah. right. But, oh, yeah. you got me a latte, but I wanted a cappuccino. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's like, it's because I didn't ask, I didn't set the expectation. Right? Mm-hmm. I should have said, hey, what are you looking for? So she could have told me so I could have delivered on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think you as assumed. a business. You assumed. Yeah, I assumed. Mm-hmm. I think as a business, you assume people are doing X, Y, and Z. But I think if we had just said it earlier and often, it would have solved a lot of these problems. That makes mm-hmm. sense. Yeah, because I, I wanted to pick your brain there because there's obviously there's a bit of give or take with it as well and if like you take on someone um there's like a good line between like taking the authoritarian approach of like this is what we want to do this is how we want to do it and then there's like a bit of take as well where it's like oh well you know what can you offer us and like how do we how do we all how do we find common ground in that as well so do, do you find that like com- compromise with your employees i guess 
or is it just stick to the one thing? Yeah, I mean, I think I think uh, in regards to staff, I, I think that over the years we've hired up people to kind of appropriately manage. See, I think one of the things that I haven't been a good, I'm not very good at is managing people appropriately. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that I tried to do earlier on that I should have learned is I try to do everything. At, and what I ended up doing was like everything at 70% instead of anything at a hundred percent. Yeah. So I look at it kind of like CrossFit for years. I was competing as an, as an individual and as an individual, your goal is to be good at everything mm. and great at nothing. Cause if you're great at running a mile, you're probably not very good at running uh, at a, Lifting, Some claims right? a little. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> so but once you get on a team, now you can kind of embrace your strengths and not worry as much about your weaknesses because the rest of the team can kind of elevate. And as an individual on a team, you want to heighten your strengths, right? Mm, yeah. One of the things we didn't do as a company, which we wish we had done earlier on, was delegate appropriately earlier on to enable people to really get to their 100% and elevate them to be great instead of all of us to be good at everything. Right? Yeah. So for me, I'm answering the phones, I'm coaching, I'm doing this, 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 this. You're doing 60% across the board when I could have had one person just do that and it would have elevated the whole game. Mm. That's another thing I kind of learned the hard way. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. natural in business though when you're starting out. You and know, it's tough without revenue. Yeah. When, well when you do, like, power. yeah, when, when I was just me at the very start, I had to be, you know, you would have as well. You mm. had to be pretty good at everything. Otherwise, something was not getting done or something right. was getting done very, very, very poorly yeah, and your yeah, business is right. not going to go ahead that way, you know? Mm. That's right. So that's probably like one of the points where you have to change as an entrepreneur, I suppose, and you have to go, right, well, this is how I have to lead in a totally different way mm. and then, yeah, put people in the, in the right roles. And the, on spending yeah, and the money. it becomes yeah, like a yeah. tipping point, right, where you say, hey, I got to hire up. <clears throat> yeah, you know, I get this all the time as a gym owner. People say, "Oh, I can't afford a coach." Well, it's like, well, if you don't think you can afford a coach, you'll never afford a coach because if you're coaching all the classes, then who's out there building the business? Mm -hmm. It just becomes this revolving door mm -hmm. where you coach all the classes, but no one's out there sharing your message. And so, mm -hmm. then what? Mm -hmm. um, just on a on an actually in gym kind of basis question: Do you actually get in and coach classes from time to time to still get your face now, or you, you actually have stepped right away? From yeah, that? I mean, this morning I taught at one of our corporate accounts. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yes. cool. Cool. I mean, I, I, I love, I mean, probably my two favorite things to do, probably three, love to coach. I love to give like uh, uh, motivational talks. Like mm -hmm. I just got back from New York giving one and I like to talk business of fitness with gym owners mm -hmm. because I think if I could talk business, they, it, that could last a lasting impression on them that they could then help their members longer. Mm. For years, I've been kind of like a like a like an animal in a cage you know I'd show up to events a and big bear mate yeah, <laughs> big yeah. bear with a hairy crack bear in a cage yeah, bear, bear, bear. <laughs> I'd be like I'd be like you know snatching or doing whatever and people would be watching and they'd get inspired but then after that inspiration they kind of leave and they go do their own thing yeah, that's now right. if I can inspire an owner and they could build their business. Now, all of a sudden, they're building more trajectory for their staff and for their members. Mm -hmm. So that that's where I get a lot of, you know. Drive. And drive. Yeah, yeah, mm. cool. Um, there's a lot of gyms mm. out there. So um, Tommy's heavily involved in CrossFit. I was a CrossFitter for a bunch of years there. Jason already um, knows that. I mean, yeah. this isn't exactly small. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, there's a lot of – so in CrossFit – I've got a lot of friends that are affiliate owners and a lot of people that I know and so forth from the Australian community, basically. And a lot of the gyms aren't exactly thriving, it's right. fair to say. Where do you think people are falling down in that regard? Because you're obviously the opposite of that. You know, NC Fit is thriving and thriving and thriving and, and you're helping gyms to get out there and do the same thing. Like, what are people... Where's it breaking down in, in that community well, in particular? I, I think it's a byproduct of two things. Number one is, just like anything, in any industry that saw the growth that CrossFit has, you will have people that will fail, period. Mm. I mean... Mm. It, whether it's CrossFit, mm. opening, uh, uh, you know, a coffee shop, whatever mm. it may be, mm -hmm. uh, you know, especially when it's a license model, yeah. not a franchise, it's totally different. Yeah, because you can do what you want. That's right. Mm. Where if you open up a, a McDonald's or whatever it may be and you're licensing a name, they give you guidelines and expectations and the barrier to entry is high. Mm. For example, if I want to go open up a McDonald's. Subway or whatever, <laughs> the barrier to entry is Five hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, right? So now, for me to get that, I need to have a business plan, and you go find funding. I need to do X, Y, and Z. For a CrossFit gym, you can open it with twenty grand. Yeah, it's true. And mm. so the barrier to entry is low, the learning curve is high, and there's no franchise model that's that's replicated. Mm -hmm. So what happens is you have this amazing growth because anybody can open one, mm -hmm. but then a lot of people open it as a hobby and not as a business. Mm. And then what happens is they don't make any money. They don't make any money. They don't make any money. Now all of a sudden they're two, three, four years down the line. And what they start realizing is their passion, they start developing resentment for it because they're losing money every month yeah. or they're breaking even. And one of the things that a lot of these owners don't realize is if you're making 20, 30, 
So I've been on the phone probably in the last two months, I've been on the phone probably 250 to 300 gym owners mm. just in the last couple months. And one of the things I try and explain to them is like, hey, what's your take home income? You know, on average, let's call it 2,500 bucks. Mm-hmm. But if you actually evaluate this based on risk, they're actually negatively money, right? Because if you're making $2,500 a month, but you have all the risk and liability of your staff, someone getting hurt, mm-hmm. it's actually negative. Mm, yeah. You're better off closing the doors and go becoming a member of a gym and go find another job. Yeah. Mm. And so these owners need to realize that it's not a hobby, it's a business, and they need to treat it like one. Mm. That's a tough one, isn't it? Because <laughs> it's tough, like, like, especially when like the sweep of CrossFit came and people were like, oh shit, you know, like, gyms are starting to build and stuff. There's like a disconnect between going, oh fuck man, I'm just gonna be able to like <laughs> make people laugh and train all day. Well, the majority of your time is actually on a computer. Mm. You know? <laughs> That's right. It's a real tough one. Well, I mean, it, it, it is a real tough one because what I find more than not, and I've probably talked to more gym owners than potentially anybody in the space, is that, you know, it'd be three buddies, they join a gym, they get fired about CrossFit, which it's life-changing, mm. right? But it's like, okay, you throw in 10 Gs, you throw in 10 Gs, there's no partnership agreement, there's nothing. Mm, yeah. mm-hmm. And it's just because they're inspired by it because it changed their life. And yeah. I think there's nothing wrong with that. And actually, it's, it's motivating to me. Problem is, is that, you know, I love food, love it. But it doesn't mean that I think I'm qualified to go open up a restaurant. Mm, yeah, mm, exactly. Right? I'd rather just go eat fine dining, <laughs> yeah. and then you know yeah. have some margaritas. Yeah, go and do, go and do something that you know and that you've uh, that you've got a business plan and a, and a model. Yeah, well, I think it's something to be back to you know earned confidence versus perceived confidence and you know competitive advantage. Mm-hmm. I mean, for me, at the age of 14, I started working at a gym, right? So from when I was 14 to when I was 21, I worked at a gym and then I opened up the gym, mm-hmm. my own gym at 22. Mm-hmm. So for seven years, I developed knowledge, front desk, sales procedures, you know, writing the elliptical every night. And these were things that allowed me to have a competitive advantage and have the earned confidence through all this hard work mm. to go open up a business. Mm. But I think there's something different between that and just perceived. Yeah, like, that's interesting. I could perceive that I have confidence and slap myself in the face and say, yeah, I could do this. Mm. But if you haven't earned that right, it's a lot more challenging. Yeah. You know, think about it like a UFC fighter, right? Yeah. And they go into the ring, they've earned the right to be in there from decades of training. Whereas if one of us go in there, it's a totally different thing. We could, mm. we I'm could not going t- in there with any right. sort of perceived confidence, my <laughs> yeah, friend. Yeah, we can tell ourselves <laughs> all we want. Before you punch me, <laughs> let's do a snatch off. Right. Let's do a win. <laughs> right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, though? for like, sure. Yeah, so I think as a, as a business owner, I think regardless of what business you get into, I think it's very simple. Mm. You could ask yourself, you know, am, what is my competitive advantage? Mm. Am I qualified to do this? And is it a good time for me to do this, mm-hmm. right? I mean, because if it's not good timing, you just had a kid or whatever, it, it, you know, you, you might be better off just taking a step back for a minute. Mm. Mm. That's interesting, the old perceived confidence versus the, uh, the, earned confidence. the earned confidence. I've never heard that before, but it makes perfect sense. Mm. Mm. Um, I like it. So, Jay, so you being the, you know, centerpiece of NC Fit and, and obviously – top of the pile like what do you do to always be bettering yourself do you put a bit of like time into becoming a better you know entrepreneur more well-rounded person like what are some of the things because you're a high achiever you know people like to hear from high achievers mm. what they do their tips and tricks like what do you do well, to yeah, always be I, better? I embrace this mentality called AMRAP mentality which <clears throat> will be coming out soon and basically the AMRAP mentality is is this idea of like you know, I was married, trying to grow a business, you know, trying to compete. I'm like, man, how do I balance all these different things? And the, the idea was, is that if I treated each facet of my life like an AMRAP, I could be more successful because I'm being present and focused on it. It's like right now when we're podcasting, I'm just AMRAPing with you guys. Like I'm mm-hmm. sitting here, I'm looking you guys in the eye, we're having a good conversation. Mm. I'm not on my phone. I'm not, you know, doing anything else. I'm just focused on you guys. And I think sometimes as, as human beings, we're, it's, we're just so distracted all the time that we're not very productive. Yeah. And so one of the things that I try and do is when I'm at work, work. When I'm at home, home. When I'm training, I'm training. Like I told you guys when you guys got here, I was like, hey, I need to go work out real quick. I took 12 minutes, just did my own thing. Mm-hmm. Don't, 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 just, just you guys chill out yeah, here. Yeah. I'll be right back. Yes. Right? But that's the kind of being present and focused that could allow you to get more work done in less time. So the AMRAP mentality is just about identifying what you want to focus on. Mm-hmm. Right? So for me, it's business, family, fitness. Then, uh, switch gears or actually work hard at, you know, each thing that you're doing throughout the day, switch gears in between them. Right. Mm-hmm. So that right now I'm doing this, then I'm doing this. And then, you know, every now and then reevaluate what your priorities and what your focuses are. And so I think for me as a, as a, as a individual, as an entrepreneur, as whatever I'm trying to do, I want to make myself as uncomfortable as I can, as often as I can. Mm-hmm. So that means, you know, I roll jujitsu when I'm home, probably three days a week. 
that's very much so getting comfortable with uncomfortable, mm-hmm. right? Um, it, it's, it's getting me outside my norm and that only helps me. Mm. I try and do public speaking as much as I can because the more I do it, the more comfortable I can get mm. with that uncomfortableness. Yeah, for sure. I try and put one. myself in a positions where your back's up against the wall a little bit and you either man up and you get through it or you kind of learn from it, right? Yeah, that's great. I think, yeah, let, me, let, me, uh, let me say this, Jace. I think you just uttered the most crossfitter sentence I've ever heard. What was it? We're sitting here, we're podcasting, I'm just, I'm air rapping with you guys. guys. I'm air rapping with you guys, right? I'm like, well, yeah, I suppose you are. (laughs) Hey, are we recording? But I know. Stand by. Go. But but it's about but it's about I, I know what you're saying, it's about just being present and sure. uh, and actually being all in with what you do. Yeah. And, and it I feel still like fucking hard to switch that mentality times. Like I I would hate it. Like I mean I, I do from time to time, but like if I'm spending time with my missus after like a good day, a hard day of you know, whatever, like I'll be like, Oh shit, I didn't send that email. You know, mm. how do you what do you do to flick the switch then? Yeah, and, I, and I'm not saying I'm perfect at it, but it's something I'm aware of, right? Mm. It's it's you know, someone asked me the other day, I was I was speaking in front of a group of, of finance executives the other day, and they're like, So, you know, I, I don't know if I'm doing a good job. It's just like, look, the fact that you're at least aware that you're not as present as you could be means you're already on the right track. Mm. Yeah, that's right. And so the fact that you could sit there and be like, you know what? I shouldn't have been on my phone when I was doing this, like that's something I constantly remind myself with and I'm not perfect Mm. at all. I got a long road to go, Mm -hmm. but at least I'm aware enough to say, Hey, when I'm doing this, I need to, I need to learn how to just let go. And it's tough because you know, I'm very entrepreneurial in that sense. Like, especially in business, if I, something comes up in my head, boom, I want to act on it. Mm. But the way I could act on it is if something comes up in the head, you know, just write myself a note. I shoot myself an email and I can address it later. Mm. You shoot yourself an email. Yeah. That's one of your things. That's cool. Yeah, mm. cool. Most people just go like this. <laughs> yeah, because I'm not like I'm not like a notes taker, and like some of our guys, like they take a lot of notes and they draft stuff. For me, if I really want to do it, I'll just I'll just uh, write myself an email and then shoot it to myself. Mm. Because what I like to do is at the end of the day, I like to look, you know, like for example, if I have a really busy day, I'll have tons of emails. One of them will be for me. I'll start going off, 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 and I'll leave the one for me. Then once I get to the one for me, then I'll address it. Mm. Yeah, that's actually. <laughs> um, oh, Jace got back to me. That's actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, love it. I wonder how he is. Fuck it, back yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's Maybe actually. Um, that's actually great. <laughs> See, I. I get business-related stuff coming in from all different angles, from Instagram messages, Facebook messages, mainly probably via email. And I always say to people, can you, whatever they've written, I say, can you please email that same thing to me? Just cut and paste mm. it. Because if it goes into my email, I'll action it. I've got, a, I've got like a flagging, you know, a proper system that I use in my email. But then for my own notes, I don't really like kind of mm. thing, you know what I mean? So that's actually a really good tip. Mm. Email yourself. Mm. Yo, Doc, can I do this <laughs> on Monday? What's up, man? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I- that's what that's what helps me. Mm. Yeah, I like I, it. I mean, so that's what helps me. I like so it. So, what about your training then, Jay? So, we love the business stuff, but um, are you still are you still competing? Have you retired now? You retired? So yeah, yeah. So basically, um, so I competed as an individual seven times uh, yeah. on a team in 2015, and then 2016 season came around, and then obviously my daughter was diagnosed. It was mm. a very easy decision. Cool. Um, and you know. I thought about doing the open and stuff like that, but I don't really have any aspirations to go to the games again. Mm. Um, that 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 kind of ship has sailed for me. I'm more inspired by, you know, the business side and things of that nature. I still remain, you know, very fit. I still work out every day with the gym and with the classes, mm-hmm. but I don't have the same drive. And so, it's, you know, the takeaway here is that I think if you want to do anything, whether it be go to the CrossFit Games or build a business, you got to have a cert- strong internal drive of why you're doing it. Mm. Otherwise, when things get challenging, it's very easy to be like, ah, you know what, forget it. Mm, yeah, you know, I've sure. been, my back's been up against the wall in competition a lot of times. And like, you think about it, w- when it gets tough, it doesn't matter how many social media followers you get or how much money you're making, you're going to fail if you don't have a strong internal deep drive. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I just, I don't look at the games anymore with that same drive. So I'd rather just not place myself in that, in that zone mm. and just utilize it for fun, mm. but not competition. Yeah. And then, so, cause that, I mean, this whole, I'm just interested because like this whole entrepreneurial, you know, side of and the drive and some of that must've been formed through your competitiveness during your, your, when you were competing. Yeah. How did you actually find CrossFit in the start? And then how was that? So in 2006, I was working at the conventional gym yeah. and a buddy of mine, Austin introduced me to CrossFit. And at the time, you know, I'd just been doing the normal stuff. I'd done a little bit of Muay Thai, so a little bit of kickboxing. So I had, I had lost some weight. I was feeling pretty fit. But, um, you know, I, I, I didn't understand this concept of going against the clock. Mm. 
And it took me a little while to wrap my head around it, but once I did, it was excellent. But that same going against the clock is kind of like what I'm talking about with AMRAP mentality, right? Is get more done in less time. Mm -hmm. And so I was introduced in 2006, you know, started competing in 2007 on like YouTube. Mm. And then 2008 uh, was when I won the games. And um, yeah, I mean, kind of just everything's kind of evolved ever since. Mm. But I've had some good mentors along the way, you know, some good people that have taught me a lot of good stuff and um, kind of taken me underneath their wing and kept me inspired cool mm. hey um jace i got a question regarding the sport of crossfit in general so <clears throat> as a gym owner somebody who's trying to bring general pop people get them in get them in the door help them better their life whatever they want to do lose weight look better more self-confidence whatever that's what crossfit does right what do you think of the sport of fitness in regards to getting people through the door in your gym because i feel like the way that the crossfit games is promoted might stop people from walking through the doors yeah, of the gym i think there's a is a major I mean, I would make the argument, I don't know if mm. the CrossFit Games have been good or bad for CrossFit. Yeah. I, I, I can't answer that. The good thing is it builds awareness. The bad thing is that it gives a lot of mis preconceived yeah. uh, opinions. Yeah. So for us, you know, we're NC Fit. We're NC Fit because we want to be in control of someone's first impression. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then when they come in, a program we offer is CrossFit at some of our locations. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, but a program we offer is CrossFit. Mm. And we're, we're, we're fans of it. But it's not our brand. Mm, yeah. Our brand and our identity is is for us to distinguish. And um, you know, I think that's one of the downsides of CrossFit Games is that a lot of people have preconceived notions that CrossFit is this crazy thing. Yeah, yeah. And at the end of the day, it, it's actually not. I mean, CrossFit is the everyday person getting in better shape. Mm -hmm. But perception is reality. And that's why we had to brand ourselves as NC Fits so that we could be in control of our own destiny. Mm. Mm. That's such an interesting... It's Yeah, it's such a good point. Like, even as a coach, one of the biggest... Um, barriers from a personal perspective you hear is like oh you know I really want to cross it but I feel like I just need to get in shape before I need to get in shape first and didn't do some PT first you know but I, I really feel like kind of what you said could be the way it's going to evolve where there'll be almost some gyms that are just kind of directed towards the competition based side of CrossFit and then there are just other gyms that are just general pop sort of stuff you know I mean I think CrossFit's changed the fitness industry forever I, I think, totally agree you know it introduced functional <coughs> fitness it introduced against the clock it did a lot of great things F45 came from CrossFit yeah. all the all the global gyms have got functional functional spaces Yoga. and high so, intensity so yeah. if you think about it 24 hour fitness was down here in terms of complexity and coaching mm -hmm. or your traditional gym mm -hmm. CrossFit came in up here with complexity coaching a lot of complexity complex gymnastics complex weightlifting mm. what happened is this giant gap in the middle and that giant gap has been filled with Barry's Boot Camp mm -hmm. F45 Orange Theory right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because there's people that want more coaching <clears throat> and more complexity mm. but not as much as what CrossFit's offering mm. So what we've done as a business is we have three tailored offerings to hit all the areas of the gap, yep. right? We have a 30-minute offering, a 45-minute offering, and a 60-minute offering. Our 60-minute offering is the most level of complexity and variance. Mm -hmm. You have Olympic weightlifting, you have barbells, whatever. 45 is just a power lift with a Metcon, and then 30 is no barbells, just dumbbell, kettlebell, rowing, et cetera. Mm. Yeah, cool. And so at our gyms, we have a way of kind of, hey, what are you trying to do? We just want to get you more fit. Mm. So... You know, pick a program. Let's have yeah, some fun. Yeah. That's good. And do you have? Do you find that like certain demographics fit into those three? Do you see stereotypes? Or? Yeah, I mean, I think in general, what you find is that the thirty-minute class is better for someone who's not as consistent. Mm. Forty-five is good for someone who's like three days a week because um, it blends a little strength with conditioning. And then, you know, sixty minutes more for someone who's like making it a program five, six days a week. Mm -hmm. The thing is, is that CrossFit traditionally as a program, it's tough to follow only once a week. Because when you come in, there's so much variance mm. that you can never really get good at anything. Yeah. So that's why our 30-minute class is good because it doesn't take as long to develop the skill to row mm -hmm. as it mm. does to snatch. Mm. That's true. Um, Jace, I got another question on the on CrossFit itself and CrossFit HQ, and I I nervous a little bit asking you because you've been very close to the the HQ of CrossFit for for a very long time. Yeah. So me being CrossFit, I was a CrossFit coach back in the day. Very heavily intertwined in the community. Like I said, a lot of my friends are gym owners, CrossFit owners, and their livelihood goes, you know, in hand in hand with a CrossFit brand. Mm. Um, what do you think about some of the controversies that have been behind, like, the, obviously, there's the Glock thing that came out. There was a bunch of, like, little mini storms on the social media from time to time that kicked up like a big the stink. The social media posts, like, with the bear. Yeah, yeah. And that. Speaking of which. Yeah, yeah. Um, what do you think, see... A lot of my friends in Australia, Rob Forte, obviously, is like a multi-time yep. CrossFit, um, CrossFit Games athlete. 
I remember him years ago making a post that brought up a bunch of the way that CrossFit HQ and their Instagram was like clowning their followers and so on and so forth with um, the posts that I'm putting out. Now, where do you stand with that whole thing? Because I feel like CrossFit don't do a good job of branding themselves in that regard. You know what I mean? Like the Glock controversy was obviously the big one. Obviously yeah. worldwide, it was very much of a, like Americans, obviously guns are a big part of your, you know, of your. I mean, it was very polarizing. The yeah. Glock in particular. I mean, think about yeah. we're in California. We're mm-hmm. in a very, very liberal democratic state, mm-hmm. right? And my political, uh, religious or, you know, preferences of any kind have no bearing on our business for yeah. us. Yeah. So we are not pro or anti anything. Yeah. We're just neutral. And, um, you know, so that was, that was challenging for us, but I mean, that's, that's why we're, you know, we're NC fit. We're in charge no, of, right. we're in charge of our brand. We look, we can't control what CrossFit does and they're going to do what they're going to do and more power to them. Mm. And any affiliate owner that has a problem with the way CrossFit's doing things, you know what? It's their, that's their fault. That's, mm. that's, that's the gym owner's fault. CrossFit has zero obligation to do anything for the affiliate. Zero. Yeah, You're but paying what about- a license fee, right? So yeah. if you don't think that the, if you don't think the brand is benefiting your business, then you have an obligation as a business owner to do something different, yeah. right? And I think a lot of times people complain, CrossFit HQ does this, CrossFit HQ does that. Well, my recommendation would be, hey, look, if you don't like what they're doing, no one's forcing you to do anything. No, that's right. You mm. know? That's yeah. right. But but I just think, yeah, I don't think they do a great job of um, helping their helping their affiliates out to a degree because there's yeah. a lot of people that that, exactly like you said, they're like, well, you know what? You know, this whole furor, this is my brand that's getting kind of dirtied with it along along the way. Like I had a friend, Stu, I remember he was a CrossFit affiliate owner and he was at the very point of like, right, I think I'm going to take my name away from CrossFit and become, you know, Stu Fit or whatever, right. for example, because of these controversies that unfortunately mm. like drag the affiliate as well you know, along you know through, what, the, though, through the name. devil's advocate on that. There, there are some people that would like, there are some other people, you know, because uh, Australia's very similar to, you know, the sort of political references that you see in California, for the most part. Mm-hmm. Um, there would be some owners, you know, or people that are affiliated, I imagine, that would be very for what they're doing because they love to hunt and, you know, they, they like guns and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, like, but I think what Jason's... A, I think what a sleeping J- statement to say that, like, it brings it down. No, I, I, think what Jason I, said, don't. I think what Jason said was spot on. Like, you don't put any of your political, any of your religious, any of your beliefs into your business, you know, because sure. you want to bring... You want to... Your main goal is to get people healthy, fit, and, and mm. give them a well, good community, a, a, you know? A great way to think about it is like music, right? Yeah. Music at our gym is neutral. Yeah. When you go into our gym, you shouldn't even think about the music. Mm. Meaning, what, what should inspire you and keep you coming is our coaching and our product, yeah, period. Sure. Music should just be this neutral thing in the background. Like, when I go to a Starbucks, I don't really care about the music because it's not something I even pay attention to, yeah. right? Mm. But I don't expect it to be vulgar rap yeah, with death derogatory, metal or, yeah, yeah. right? And so for us... When you go into our gym, it, it should be a neutral thing. So we're not going to play any ex- exceptions here mm-hmm. or here. Same thing goes for political, religious, etc. It shouldn't even be a factor. It should no, just be right. a neutral thing outside the business. Mm-hmm. And, you know, back to the little CrossFit HQ thing. I mean, look, I think a gym owner has a very, it's a very easy thing for them to decide. If it benefits our business to have it on the outside of our building, do it. If it doesn't, then don't. Mm-hmm. And they need to make that decision. But I think this this storm is coming where everybody, you know, hates on certain things that CrossFit's doing. But at the end of the day, you know, CrossFit's going to continue to do what they're doing, and they're going to keep right, wrong, or indifferent, and more mm-hmm. power to them. Mm-hmm. But as a gym mm-hmm. owner, you got to be about your business. Yeah, that's right. And and it, you know, and and you could have your emotions and whatever about CrossFit, but for me. I've realized that there's nothing I could do about it. It's outside of my control. Mm. I just need to stay focused on our business and what we're providing and let them do what they're doing. Let us do what we're doing. For sure. And I think, I think that's a, yeah, it's a, think, good, it's a good point as well. Sorry, just to cut you off, but like blaming other things for, you know, for, I've just, I just finished listening to Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink. So yeah. this is like right in the head at the moment, but like taking that standpoint and be like, oh, you know, because of CrossFit's controversial with this you know I've lost all my, my members and everything is, and it's yep, fucked yep, yep. and oh you know now my right. wife's fucking divorced me and like <laughs> right. oh, yeah, my crack's really hairy <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but like yeah no, it's, it's a good point just to be like well <clears throat> focus on the things you can't control and if it just goes to happen that CrossFit's 
political agenda did actually have an effect on you, well, then you can make that appropriate decision if you need to. That's right. Mm. And I, I think oftentimes, I mean, look at it just like in CrossFit programming. Every competitor wants to blame their programming for the lack <laughs> of results they're getting. Mm. It's because it's something they could point at that's not directly their, their, mm. in their control. Mm. But what I would say to them is, guys, you, you know what's in your control is your effort that you're putting out in the mm. workouts. And I don't believe, I, th- I think effort trumps any other you know, uh, programming or whatever it may be, you got to put in the effort. Mm, yeah, for Same sure. thing goes with business. If you're executing, whether you have CrossFit on your brain or not, if you're executing, if you're servicing your clients, if you're getting out into the public, if you're building your business and you're truly about it, you will be successful. Mm, yeah, but for if sure. not, 100%. you're going to try and, you're going to try and find things you could pinpoint. And this is mm-hmm. one of them. Now, eventually over time, every business owner needs to make a decision that if it is actually negatively impacting, then they have an obligation to actually do something about it. Yeah, mm. for sure. And I think CrossFit's great. Like you said, I 100% agree that it's revolutionized the way people train forever. I think it's great. Um, I just think they do things that, you know, doesn't help as well mm. to, yep. to a lesser degree, you know? Mm. Um, this, uh, my fitness ability has got nothing to do with my heroin addiction. It's actually <laughs> your programming, mate. Uh, so if you could just change something up. Yeah. Yeah. I've, right. got, I've got an issue with you, mate. Right. Really got a heroin gag in there, Tommy. Yeah. It hasn't been, Always been make a- sure there's one heroin gag in, uh, in every show. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. so Jay, so yeah, what is your training like these days? Are you pretty just um are you, you know, just general health and fitness, get into an hour a, a day or kind of you yeah. big into your lifting or what do you do? I, I try and get on like a just a five by five back squat once mm-hmm. a week, pretty simple. Um, try and take our, our general uh, NC Fit 60-minute class yeah, cool. as mm. often as I can, right, at all of our different locations. We have an app that's available to the public. It's 100% free. You can see all of our different workouts. It's pretty cool. Nice. Um, but uh, basically, I take a workout, and then a couple times a week when I'm home at least, um, I try and roll jiu-jitsu. Yeah, mm. man. Cool. So, man, more and more people are talking about jiu-jitsu. Is it, I feel like it's something I've got to get into now. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, you got you to... Gotta, yeah, it's it's great. Yeah, why do it's, you love? It? Oh, you've done it from a couple years. From a, yeah, it's it's um, it's great. Mm. You just got to get past the first six months. <laughs> I've been it's, a total spa just yeah, getting choked, yeah, choked yeah. out ten there's times a, a day. There's a huge <laughs> learning <laughs> curve to it. Yeah, there's a huge learning curve, and there mm. always will be. But what I like about it is, it's like um, it's like a game of chess, and there's always something to learn. Mm. Mm. So it's nice, you know, for me because like again, you get comfortable with uncomfortable. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Nothing so, more uncomfortable than having a bloke on your back trying to choke you out as well. Oh, yeah. Depends <laughs> on what you mean by uncomfortable. Yeah, <laughs> That's right. Especially yeah. if he's serenading you. So, so one of <laughs> okay, my, um, <laughs> I'm a massive UFC fan, and uh, one of my best mates, we're like UFC buddies. Like every card we'll go and sit down and watch together and stuff. And he's just started rolling jujitsu. And obviously, like I said, like being well entwined in CrossFit. And, and the way people talk about CrossFit is like, I've started this thing called CrossFit and I can't fucking believe it. I'm so... And they're like five or six days a week, they're hooked, you know? Right. I feel like... And I've got a few mates that, that have started rolling now and I feel like the community is the same and the the, the passion is the same. Mm. You know, that when I hear someone talking about jiu-jitsu, like Frey, he's te- this is my mate, he's texting me every time he goes to roll, every time there's a promotion <laughs> on his jiu-jitsu club, whatever, he's sending it to me. Come on, bro, you've got to get down here. Yeah. It's sick. It's so like... And I think it's that community aspect and the skill accuracy acquisition thing yeah, you know like right. when you start actually going out in Olympic lifting for the first time you're like this is so fucking hard but I feel like I'm getting a little bit better at this you know and that you get really addicted to that as well, hey. you get addicted yeah. to that kind of like um, that progress and that skill that learning mm. yep. I feel like it's the community it's the progress mm-hmm. and it's 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 a community the progress and um, you know the self defense aspect is obviously yeah. great about it right yeah. so I, I think for me one of the other things that draws me is obviously I love to learn I love to learn I don't ever want to stop but I also like the idea of just these are these are gonna be useful tools that I could keep forever. Yeah, I've I've developed a level of fitness that's good, and it dramatically helps me in jujitsu. Dramatically, mm-hmm. I would recommend anybody who does jujitsu to get out there and, and utilize fitness mm. for sure. However, these are skills I can use for the rest of my life, which is nice because it's just it's just nice to kind of build that hedge. Yeah, for sure. It's self development that you never that you never lose. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah. Do you actually feel like you it's good self defense? Like if someone came at you, <laughs> you'd be like, "All right, mate, let's go for a roll." Like, like what, what, I just never understood roll me, that mate. one because yeah. jiu-jitsu is all on the floor. Hey, no, Brazilian. you start standing. Ah, oh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Is I mean, you start standing, then you get on the floor. So the idea is you you go to the floor. But I mean, I mean, I mean, you look at the UFC as an example. Mm-hmm. I'd say 95% of them have a foundation in Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu, mm-hmm. period. Mm-hmm. So if you look at just that alone, mm. if you assume UFC is the highest level of hand to hand combat, mm-hmm. let's just say, yeah. what do they use to train? 
are those two. Mm, yeah. In general. Now, there's variations, right? There's American kickboxing, there's Sancho, there's Chinese kickboxing, there's Japanese different Jiu-Jitsu. Stuff. There's obviously yeah. judo, there's wrestling. But at the end of the day, those are the foundation. Mm. There's stand-up and there's floor work. And uh, yes, it's extremely effective. Mm, mm. I mean, I'd, you know... I reckon, I reckon Ava, Jason Storter could choke me out right now. Yeah. You know, yeah. like I yeah. couldn't fight my way out of I, it's cold embarrassing break. how should I ever fight him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. So it, it'd be nice it, to know I could it, handle it, myself. It'd be nice if you started going and you watch people <clears throat> who are significantly smaller than you be able to manipulate yeah. their body. That's like, right. It's, it's, it's mind-blowing because you can just take someone's strength and just manipulate the way you want. Yeah, mm. yeah. My mm. friend Mitch was talking about um, when he first uh, when he first got someone in a rear naked choke, and he was obviously he was like, "What's the first belt? Like a purple belt or something it's like white. that? White belt, of course, white belt." So he was a white belt, and for like three <laughs> months he was just rolling around with like white belts and guys that were like one or two stages above him, and he was just getting like choked out, arm bars, whatever, all the all the moves and so forth. And then he reckons uh, they film all the rolls, and then so Mitch was in this um, in this role with this guy. And he remembers like he somehow like found his way to his back and he's like, right, I've got his back. And then he was hand fighting and he's like, oh, I've got his hand. Sunk the choke in and he's finally, he's like, and Mitch was like, oh my God, yeah, I did it. Yeah. And then anyway, he went and watched the video and apparently the dude he was rolling with, he like gave Mitch his back and then Mitch is, he's like, oh yeah, here you go. You can have my hand. Got him in the choke. He's like, yeah, sweet. Mitch, and he finally watched videos like, ah, oh, Congratulations, fuck. man. Yeah. You got me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, that's the part oh, where you got to take your ego aside. Like for me, yeah. um, you know, for how long I've been rolling for, it's important to work your different games. So mm-hmm. my top game's good. My bottom game's not as good. So I got to be open and okay with, with, especially with different belt levels, just playing the bottom. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And they're going to think they're crushing you, and that's okay, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because you want to develop that skill. Yeah, right? for sure. Mm. And so it works both ways. Cool. So I want to ask um, about fear and what that's like for you because you said before you you love to get um as as comfortable being uncomfortable as you possibly can and and what it's like for you in that moment let's just say public speaking did you was public speaking a tough one for you when you first started out with it or um yeah yes and no i mean in high school i wasn't like great at it but what happened is i actually a test i actually credit crossfit hq for most of my public speaking ability because I started teaching seminars for CrossFit HQ mm. in 2009, and I taught over 100 seminars for them, right, over the next three years, yeah. maybe, maybe, maybe around 100. Mm-hmm. And every seminar, oh, not everyone, but after like 20 <coughs> seminars, I started giving lectures, because that's like how you kind of, you work your ranks. Mm. And so at first I started giving one lecture, then two, then some seminars I'd be giving three or four lectures and that's you standing in front of a group. So how I developed that skill is I'd videotape myself. I'd give myself the lecture against the video camera. I'd play it back. I'd even give like little jokes like, <laughs> you know, hey, show me your squat. Oh, you know, whatever. And I'd, I'd be like, <laughs> email you know, himself. Yeah. And, Watch uh, it back. Oh, that was funny. Good one. And so that, that was one of the ways I developed the, the public speaking. Mm. And I mean, it's still something I develop all the time, but I think it's something that, you know, I learned at an earlier age, um, specifically with selling gym memberships. Is mm. it, was, it was an easy way to interact, right? So at the age of, um, I, I was a freshman in college, so I was like 17, 18 years old. I started going from the front desk to sales, and that was a great way to get to interact with people. Mm. And so the more you interact, especially at a younger age, you start to learn how to talk to people. Mm. 100%. So, yeah, so um, just going on from that, what, what's something now that you, you, um, you, know, you find a little bit uncomfortable still or something you kind of want to work towards just having that skill in the bag? <laughs> I mean, I think for me, like, you know, I love public speaking, but I, I don't think it's necessarily, a, I don't think it's necessarily a skill in the bag. But what I do is I, I really beat myself up. If I don't think I delivered the best product I could, mm. you know, like every time I'm done speaking or doing something, I'm always asking like, Hey, could I have done better? Like, even after this talking to you guys, like, could I have answered that question better? What could mm-hmm. I have done better? Cause like I'm my own worst critic. Right. Mm. And I kind of have this paranoia where I always think there's someone coming up on me. There's always, there's always competitors trying to get us. And I want to embrace that paranoia. I want to embrace the fact that I am paranoid. But it's a good thing. Yeah. But as long as you can, it's constructive. Mm, yeah. Right? It can drive you forward rather than crazy. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. For so sure. that's cool. what I think about all the time. Mm, cool. Um, Tommy, should we go to six from six? Yeah. I reckon we should. Yeah. 
Sounds so, good. So, Jace. <laughs> he doesn't we, know what it is. Let's keep him in the dark here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jace, take your pants off. Another, <laughs> another, another take your pants off, okay? <laughs> we'll throw that in again. We've got like three inappropriate sex gags. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, so, Jace, you know. Can we talk again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. we'll get it out. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Jace, we normally finish with um, three questions from me, three questions from Tommy. Yep. So, are you ready? I'm ready. Good. So, my first question is favourite travel destination you've, uh, you've been and why? That's a great question. Um, we've got him. <laughs> uh, I've been to a lot of places, uh, but probably the most sentimental is Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, because that was a place I used to go with my daughter a lot. Yep. And now we're going back at the end of March because she can finally travel abroad again. Awesome. Mm. And so that would probably be my favorite place to travel. And the reason why is because we get to go back there now that our treatment's done. Yeah, cool. But I also That's like, nice. you know, I've been to uh, Queensland, uh, New Zealand was great. Mm-hmm. Turks and Caicos. I mean, there's a lot Where? of beautiful Turks and Caicos. Where's that? It's in the Caribbean. Right. Oh, shit. I've it's, never even heard of that. Awesome. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. great. I'm travel um, Yeah. I just got <laughs> back from Rio de Janeiro. That was pretty cool. Rio's I great. love Asia. Hong Kong's cool. Mm. Singapore's cool. Like, there's mm. a lot of cool places. Mm. But the one that's close to my heart is, is Cabo. Mm. Yeah, cool. Good answer. Um, okay, so similar vein, uh, your dream destination, absolute top of your bucket list, place you haven't been. Um, I want to go climb uh, Machu Picchu. Ooh, nice one. That's a nice one. Yeah, I mean, for me, like, I've traveled so much, I've seen all these beautiful cities. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but I think for me, I want to go do this with my wife. I want to just go climb the mountain and just kind of do something outdoors. Yeah, sick. Mm. I've done much with you. That's great. Yeah. yeah so it's I, just, um, it's one of those places where, because if you actually think about it, like, what the fuck was that city doing on top of that? Like, <laughs> right. you, you get there and you go, why is this here? How? Mm. Right. Like, why? How did they, how'd they build it? Yeah. Like, it's exactly. just so inspiring. Yeah, mm. exactly. So, nah, great. And then my third and final question is, um, any books that you like to recommend to people, anything that's kind of changed your life, even just a, uh, a fun read that, you know, got you out of a bad place. Well, I mean, or obviously I got to plug my book. So Amrap mentality will be coming out in, um, the next couple months here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm really excited about it. It's been in the works for over two years. Uh, but it's finally getting to a place where it will be ready. Cool. And, but also like Mark Cuban sport of business. That was really good. Yeah. Right. Um, I haven't read it in a little while, but I, I liked it. Um, I thought, you know, Gary V's most recent book, Crushing It, mm. I thought was good in terms of just thinking about social media a little bit differently. Um, those have been some of the ones I've kind of most recently. Obviously, Tim Ferriss puts out some great books. Yeah, mm. I'm reading uh, what's Tools of Titans. Tools of Titans. Yeah. Reading mm. Tools of Titans at the moment, which is great. That was um, his second. Second? That's the because he's got Tribe of Mentors. As Tribe well, of Mentors yeah. is the yeah. most recent one. The yeah, Tools of Titans was the four hours. Obviously, yeah. the fucking he released them about um, he released them like it felt like about three months apart. Those two yeah. books, super that's, close. Yeah, it was really Tribe of yeah. Titans. <laughs> yeah, Tribe Titans. Tribe Titans. Yeah, yeah. Hey, that's uh, it for so me. Jace, what do you like to? I kind of feel like I have a kind of an, an under of what you're going to say here. But <laughs> what do you like to do when you have some downtime, spare time? I mean, obviously, it's just spending time with the kids, traveling. For I sure. Mean, you know, like when I go to, when I'm going to Europe, I'm, I'm taking them with me. Any opportunity I can where it's like, you know, not Asia necessarily. I don't really, I haven't really taken the kids there yet. Mm. But anything that I'm there for a couple more days, mm. um, I'll take them. How old's your son, man? My son's four. My daughter's, well, my son's technically, he turns four next month and so does my daughter. Okay. Or my daughter turns seven. Daughter turns seven, right. So yeah, cool. four and seven. Mm-hmm. Cool. And, um, okay, cool. So uh, the second one is who is someone you look up to? Like someone that inspires you or... Yeah, like a mentor, a mentor. I mean, as of recently, man, I've just been running into a lot of people I just get fired up by. And it's not necessarily like the whole thing, but I pick little pieces that I get inspired by. Like Gary Vee, I never met anybody in my life that was so just like, ba ba ba. You know, <laughs> then, you, then you sit down with Tim Ferriss and he's just so educated. Then you meet with, you know, these other guys that I talk to on a regular basis who are really good at their specific things. And mm-hmm. I try and pick up traits of different people. Because maybe, for example, there's a guy that I know, hypothetically, who's very work, you know, he's strategic, you, you're inspired by it, but maybe his family side or I'm not as inspired by yeah, it, right? For sure. And so I think for me, there's multiple people in my life that I just kind of pick up on different things that I like about them mm. and I aspire to be that in the different areas. Mm. Um, so it's not just necessarily one person. For uh, sure. That, that grab my, I mean, if I had to say one person based on, I don't know him personally, but if I had to say it'd be The Rock. Yeah, he's a ripper, isn't he? 
Good hair. Good hair. Yeah, he's, he's great. Yeah. I mean, he's he's just legit. Yeah, I think he's, uh, I think he's referred to as Dwayne Johnson now. He's yeah. moved on from the Rock, Jason. I think it's, yeah, uh, it's uh, uh, Rock is your last name, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. 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 Hello, Mr. Rock. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, finally, mate, um, if you can invite three people to dinner, dead or alive, who would they be and why? So. I guess three people that you want to just like pick their brains out. Well, d- definitely The Rock. Yep. Dwayne uh, Johnson. He's number one. <laughs> uh, Dwayne, definitely Dwayne John- Johnson. Um, uh, Adam Sandler. I think Adam cool. Sandler. Oh, that's a ripper. Yeah. We've In like Adam Sandler 1994 Adam Sandler style, like when he was at his yep. peak funniness. Yep. Yeah. Like, like, like uh, yeah. you know, old school days. Yeah. Um, I mean, he really revolutionized a lot of different things. And, uh, I, you know, I met him once and uh, he was super cool. So I'd like to sit down with him for dinner. Oh, man, that's uh, a great one. Obviously, Dwayne Johnson would be cool. Get him to Waterboy Dwayne Johnson on the yep. way yeah. in. <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, think about all these different movies he's been in. Um, and then a third one, um, uh, I mean, maybe Malcolm Gladwell, just to try and pick up on all of his his research he's done. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Mark Cuban would be really cool. Mm-hmm. So I'd probably go with Mark Cuban. Uh, Dwayne Johnson and uh, Adam Sandler. That's a little, great. Get a little cool. humor, a little neutral, and a little business. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like so, it. what would you be eating then? It would have to be halal, obviously. <laughs> what would I be eating? What would I, I think Adam Sandler's Jewish, isn't he? <laughs> oh, what would I Kosher. be eating? Can't figure it out. Halal. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, that was a stupid I don't know what question. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> oh shit! Is that it, Tommy? Is that your three? Yeah, mate. Three sorted. Well, cool. um, finally, mate, you uh, plugged your book a little bit. Um, but plug it again. Yeah, plug it again. <laughs> Anything else you want to plug? Oh uh, no, I mean, just you know, look, Amrit Mentali, the book. It's something I'm very passionate about. I think it's gonna make a big <clears throat> impact on people's lives. Mm. It'll be out in the next couple of months. No set date yet, but sometime in the summer, hopefully. Um, Obviously, you just follow me, Jason Kleep, on all different social channels, our website, Jason Kleep. And if you're a business owner, check out the NC Fit Collective. Um, basically, it's session plans, programming on our app and business tools. I think it's something really big for the industry. Um, and I think people should check it out. NC, mm. NC.fit slash collective. Go check it out. It's awesome. Cool. Sweet. Nice one. That's it right there, right? Eh? Yeah. Except for the dot. That's great. <laughs> Except for the dot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we'll pull that oh, in. <laughs> all right, Jace. Well, uh, mate, thanks for allowing us in your office and uh, thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely. Cool. Thanks for having me. And uh, that's a wrap.